Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be back at Penn State after nine years. Uh, this is where I take my, my PhD, and this is also the first Loops conference I'm attending. So it's quite a nice coincidence that it has happened here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, discrete symmetries in loop quantum gravity uh, and what they might have to do with uh, quantum data correcting codes. And uh, for those of you who have been following recent developments, you might know that quantum data correcting codes have become a pretty big subject. And mostly due to the work of uh, uh, some groups in the West Coast, Algeri, Down, Harlow, uh, Preskill, Hayden, and others. So what I will be talking about is how to see these error correcting codes as arising naturally in the quantum gravity. So this is the outline. And uh, we, I'll briefly talk about the origin of the uh, quantum error correcting codes in the context of ABS CFD. Then I'll give a very brief introduction of quantum error correction. And then I'll talk about the application going to be. So the fundamental relation of uh, ABS CFD is uh, something known as the GKP weighting relationship. And it relates uh, values in the bulk uh, of bulk fields. So R here is the radial coordinate of the ABS space time. Uh, two expectation values of operators which are living on only on the boundary of uh, ABS. Now, this equality here holds only asymptotically, that is, you know, in the, as you go towards the boundary of ABS. So then the question becomes can we reconstruct bulk fields from knowledge of boundary fields? And uh, it turns out that yes, we can do that, as shown by Hamilton, Kabat, and uh, others in 2006 that using only the knowledge of fields in the boundary, so there is no R coordinate here, so R is taken to be infinite. This integral is completely over the boundary. And this is a bulk field, so R is a finite value here. So this integral can give me the value of this field. And uh, this implies that local bulk fields are dual or actually correspond to non-local boundary operators. And the non-locality is clear from the fact that here I am integrating over the entire boundary, this dx prime is the boundary. So the way that, uh, this, so this leads to this picture of quantum error correction, which I will now describe. So this picture is the anti uh conformal diagram, and it's a cylindrical, it's a cylinder, and uh, if you have a local field that is defined at a certain point x, so this is a spatial slice sigma, and this is a single point x, then this region of the cylinder that is shaded in green, uh, this is uh, known as the uh, causal value of x, and any bulk field at this point can be the required knowledge of the operators in this, in this region. But then later on, it was shown by Kubeni, uh, uh, Rangamini, uh, and uh, others that one doesn't need knowledge of the fields in the entire uh, causal wedge or, or in this entire region, but only in, in, a, in a subset. And then, moreover, one can reduce that even further. So, looking purely as a spatial slice, so this is my point in the bulk, and this uh, A, this segment of the subset of the of the boundary. So, so this region is called the causal wedge. So this boundary of the causal wedge, this is all I need uh, to be able to reconstruct bulk fields. But now this leads to a contradiction because if I look at a single point X, it can lie in the causal wedge of more than one region. I can have a region here A, which is this region, or I can have a region B, which is this region. And I can reconstruct the fields in X, either in terms of operators defined here, which only have support in A, or in terms of operators which only have support in B. Now, what this implies is that if I have such an operator on A and operator on B, then these operators cannot be the same. And if they are not the same, then that means that there is a redundancy in the description of these bulk fields in terms of these boundary operators. 
And what Almiri Don Harlow showed was that this redundancy has the same form as that of the quantum error correcting code. So now I'm going to very briefly talk about quantum error correction. It has to be brief. So in any computation, errors are inevitable. So error correcting codes are required in order to have machines run reliably. In fact, without error correcting codes, none of our, our, our digital infrastructure would even exist. So quantum error correction codes are doing the same thing in, for quantum computation. And the typical way to do this is to encode a single logical C bit, class B bit, or a single logical Q bit in several physical uh, C bits or Q bits. And the simplest example, for instance, is a repetition code where you take a, a logical zero and encode it in three physical zeros. So then if any single one of the physical bits flips, then you can simply correct for that error using the majority rule. Of course, this is the not good enough for detecting every error, so you need more complicated error correcting codes for fixing arbitrary errors. In general, an error correcting code consists of a physical Hilbert space, an n-dimensional Hilbert space, which has a subset, uh, a k-dimensional Hilbert space, which is known as a code space, a set of quantum operations, E, acting on the physical Hilbert space, which generate errors, and a set of quantum operations, R, which reverse the effects of those errors. Now, and one of the examples of a quantum error correcting code is something known as Shor's. Peter Shor was the person who essentially triggered the quantum computation revolution uh, by his uh, factorization algorithm. So this is a nine qubit code. In this code, one physical qubit, the two states of, uh, sorry, one logical qubit is encoded in the state of nine physical qubits. Now, if you look at the structure of these states, if you look at these states, these are entangled states. They are not factorizable. And these are known as cat states or GXZ states. And the way to generate them, so, so this is a very simple quantum circuit, is so these are the inputs, these are the outputs. And here, what these represent are quantum gates. So this is a gate acting on the first two qubits. This gate acts on the second, third, and fourth qubits, and this is known as a C0 gate. So you have two C0 gates, and together their action will give you, starting from an un unintangible input state, and will give you these gas states. Now, the relationship with loop quantum gravity comes from something known as topological quantum computation. Now, topological quantum computation relies on the fact that in two dimensional systems, one can perform unitary operations on, on, on the system simply by exchanging particles. Now, in three dimensions, if you exchange particles, all you get is a positive or negative phase, bosonic or formula statistics. But in two dimensions, you can have perhaps statistics and non statistics. And this kind of a transformation in two dimensions is represented by something known as a break. So imagine I have two particles here, represented by V1 and V2, and then I exchange them. When I exchange them, or break them together, that effectively induces a unitary evolution on the tensor input space. So this is where the power of topological computation from quantum computation comes from, and why people have great hopes for it though they haven't yet been realized. Because by its topological nature, it is inherently uh, resistant uh, to local errors. Now, what does all this have to do with loop quantum gravity? Well, in loop quantum gravity, you have uh, your fundamental states are spin networks. And uh, <laughs> spin networks are diffeomorphism invariant. You can take the edge of a of a spin network, move it around, it's not going really to change the state because the state only depends on the label of that edge. But apart from small diffeomorphisms or diffeomorphisms connected to the identity, 
there is another set of symmetries that is not considered and that is discrete symmetries. Now, why should discrete symmetries be considered? Well, why not? Right? Anything that is not forbidden should happen. Some, somebody said that in Goldman or something. So, if you consider the discrete symmetries of two point gravity, then that tells you that you should also imagine what happens when the edges of spin networks can move or break around each other. Now, they cannot break arbitrarily, right? So there, there should be some notion of diffeomorphism in there. Where will this notion come from? Well, when you look at a three-stranded braid, then such a braid satisfies something known as uh, the ribomized to fold, the fold ribomized to uh, relationship. So if you look carefully at this at this thing, you have one braid which, which goes completely on top, another in the middle, and third in the back. But I can always rearrange these so that instead of sigma 1, which is this braiding operation, sigma 2, which is this braiding operation, is happening first. But if you look at these two, they are equivalent to each other because I can simply move the threads without changing the breaking. This operation can be expressed in terms of operators acting on these Hilbert spaces. And this is something known as the Yang Baxter equation. The Yang Baxter equation, as was shown in a seminal paper by Lomonoff and Kaufman, has a unique solution. This unique solution this is this R matrix, which is this two qubit gate. And this two qubit gate is actually nothing more than the C0 gate that I mentioned earlier. So, if one considers discrete symmetries in NPG, which lead to these breaking operations, then one is automatically led to the existence of uh, these kinds of uh, unitary operations. Where do these discrete symmetries come from? Well, if you look for instance at the face of a tet tetrahedron, a single triangle, and you consider what, so this is basically a combinatorial structure, a discrete structure. So what are the symmetries of a discrete structure? Well, the symmetries include, for example, reflection along, along these axes and rotations around the center. These symmetries are generated by something known as a diagonal group, right? Now, ordinarily what one would do is one would attach a single edge to this space. But if you attach a single edge to this space, then you are ignoring the degrees of freedom that are coming from these discrete symmetries. If you want to take into account those degrees of freedom, then you have to replace that edge with something else. You have to pattern the tube, the edges, into cubes. Now, as Laurent talked about yesterday, uh, his work with others has suggested that there should be a U1 uh, Q cap for the algebra uh, assigned to these functions. So it turns out, uh, as I just found out, that there is an explicit link between representations of the Yang Baxter equation and cap for the algebras. So the details remain to be worked out, but I remain confident that the two pictures will turn out to be equivalent. So these kind of discrete braiding operations can lead to the existence of uh, unitary operations on, on qubits. All of this has to do with something known as the Wilson-Thompson model. Now even if you completely think that the Wilson-Thompson model is a um, journey of fantasy, it has nothing to do with elementary particle physics, that's fine, because you can just forget about all, all of these assignments of these, uh, these uh, different braids to the neutrinos and all. Even if you just think of the, the fact that you have braids or spin network edges which can braid with each other, you still get the fact that in loop quantum gravity, you can generate uh, these cat states. And these cat states are the basic ingredients of quantum electric codes. So, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, but I hope that uh, this is a good beginning. This is a pretty picture, right?
made a long time back to work. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Nice talk. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I, I can give more details if uh, the moderator. Well, well, yes, yeah, we have time. We have three minutes. I mean, three three minutes. minutes. Three minutes. Okay. So one minute for each grade. Okay. No, so no, the duration is the network. So explaining how. The duration is spin network. Yes. Yeah? Right. Right. So this is our elementary tetrahedron. Right. We have replaced the edges with the cubes. Okay. <coughs> Now we apply, we ask what is the action of these discrete symmetries on this, these tubular structures. And so if we apply this discrete symmetry to these structures, what we find is that these tubes have to be broken up into three parts. So you get this kind of a picture, where you have three ribbons. So instead of a single one-dimensional edge, you have three stranded ribbons. And these ribbons will be braided with each other under the action of these symmetries. But there is also something more. When I perform a reflection along this axis, for instance, it braids the ribbons which are attached here, the green and the red one. But it will have a, a one more effect. The braid which the, the ribbon which is attached to the blue end will undergo a twist. Now in the Wilson Thompson model, he has braiding, but he also has these twists. These twists he associates with the charges of these elementary particles. Now again, as I said before, you can completely ignore the fact that this may or may not have anything to do with elementary particles. But you cannot ignore the fact that such excitations are present in the framework of quantum gravity if one takes the action of this case in a Does that answer your question? To some extent? Yes. Yes, yes. I'm just confused because I always thought that in spin homes, or in spin networks, we have at least these twisted geometries where the two triangles uh, do not fit together anyway. So well, this seems, this seems to have this sort of, seems to sort of fix this angle to have only three different possibilities, whereas actually in spin networks we allow for the angle to be any sometimes. Yeah. No, so that's right, and uh, from my side I can only say that I'm still in the process of understanding a lot of uh, the recent, more recent developments in the spin network uh, literature, uh, but. The reason I stuck with this, you know, I did this work related to braids back in 2010, and Guillaume, who is also here, did this preceding earlier work in 2007 and 2009. But the reason I stuck with it for so long is because of the connections to quantum computation. And then over the years, you have seen Harlow and Peskin and other people come along and say that there are quantum area correction proofs. And it turns out that, well, you can generate quantum mechanical correction proofs. So, call it, call it uh, faith or whatever you want, but there is something there. Okay. So, okay, so one very quick yeah. question because yeah. the whole minutes that the panel discussion is yeah. uh, So, the reason for spin loop. The reason to go from loops to, to, to spin, spin networks was because the, the basis uh, the, uh, we didn't have a, was over complete. Mm -hmm. In the spin network, mm -hmm. it was complete due to uh, hyperbell theory mm -hmm. in the group representation. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking tubes, mm -hmm. do we still have, have this orthonormal, uh, orthonormal basis which is, uh, which is not over complete? Yeah, sure. I mean, you would have you have more degrees of freedom, but.
but uh, those it's lovely, but you have to no, no, but, but, the, but the overcompleteness of the loop basis was because of uh, the fact that it was, you could take a loop and you could move it a little bit and you get another loop, a different state. Right? And that is. Uh, well, the, the completeness of work. Okay, I think that answers the question at least. I think you should, I suggest you continue this on your way back. Thank you very much and thanks for the <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.